Good evening. On behalf of Chapter, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to Christchurch Cathedral, whether for the first time or as a regular visitor or as a regular participant in the Macmillan Carol Concert. It's always a pleasure to welcome Macmillan here, partly, of course, because of the exciting programme and the many wonderful performances that we'll all enjoy, and partly because of the work Macmillan Cancer Support does to support so many people when they need it most. I know you'll hear more about this later in the evening. So all I'll say now is that it's a great privilege to be able to be a small part of these fundraising efforts at Christmas time. As the carols will sing and hear remind us, Christmas is not just a time of giving, it's the celebration that God came to earth to take part in human life with all its joys and sorrows and to bring healing and hope to the sick. That is the work that Macmillan does, so there's no better way to celebrate Christmas than to celebrate with them and to give to support their work. Before the concert itself begins, it falls to me to give the boring notices. Should we leave, need to leave the cathedral quickly, uh, the alarm will go off and please leave through the main entrance the way you came in unless the stewards wearing high vis tell you to do something different. Please could you check that your phones are turned off or on silent. If you do need the loo, the toilets are in the cloister, so round to my, to my left in the corner. And if you need to find those, please ask a steward. And when you leave at the end of the concert, please keep to the raised walkways around the side of Tom Quad. There's some scaffolding in the middle, which you could easily miss in the dark. We hope that this is a concert full of joy and excitement and the anticipation of Christmas. May the peace, hope and healing of the Christ child be with you, your families and all those you love this Christmas time and forever.
on this cold and dark night a warm welcome to this ancient place of prayer, a place of warmth and light. Beloved in Christ, it is this Christmas time our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass and the babe lying in the manger. Therefore let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience to the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth, and goodwill among all God's people, for unity and fellowship within the church he came to build. And because this, of all things, would rejoice his heart, let us remember in his name the poor and helpless, the cold, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and those who tend them, those who mourn the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, all those who know not the Lord Jesus, or who love him not, or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. And lastly, let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no one can number, whose hope was in the Word made flesh, and with whom in the Lord Jesus we are forever one. May the Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ give us the joys of everlasting life. And to the fellowship of the citizens above, may the King of angels bring us all. Amen.
Noel, Christmas Eve, 1913. A frosty Christmas Eve, when the stars were shining, fared I forth alone where westward falls the hill, and from many a village in the watered valley, distant music reached me, peals of bells a ringing. The constellated sounds ran sprinkling on earth's floor as the dark vault above with stars was spangled o'er. Then sped my thoughts to keep that first Christmas of all, when the shepherds, watching by their folds ere the dawn, heard music in the fields, and marvelling could not tell whether it were angels or the bright stars singing. Now, blessed be the towers that crown England so fair, that stand up strong in prayer unto God for our souls. Blessed be their founders, said I, and our country folk, who are ringing for Christ in the belfries tonight with arms lifted to clutch the rattling ropes that race into the dark above and the mad, romping din. But to me, heard afar, it was starry music, angel song, comforting as the comfort of Christ when he spake tenderly to his sorrowful flock. The old words came to me by the riches of time, mellowed and transfigured as I stood on the hill, hearkening in the aspect of the eternal silence.
King John's Christmas by A. A. Milne. King John was not a good man. He had his little ways, and sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. And men who came across him when walking in the town gave him a supercilious stare, or passed with noses in the air, and bad King John stood dumbly there, blushing beneath his crown. King John was not a good man, and no good friends had he. He stayed in every afternoon, but no one came to tea. And round about December, the cards upon his shelf, which wished him lots of Christmas cheer and fortune in the coming year, were never from his near and dear, but only from himself. King John was not a good man, yet had his hopes and fears. They'd given him no present now for years and years and years. But every year at Christmas, while minstrels stood about, collecting tribute from the young for all the songs they might have sung, he stole away upstairs and hung a hopeful stocking out. King John was not a good man. He lived his life aloof. Alone, he thought a message out while climbing up the roof. He wrote it down and propped it against the chimney stack to all and sundry, near and far. F Christmas in particular, and signed it, not Johanna's R, but very humbly, Jack. I want some crackers, and I want some candy. I think a box of chocolates would come in handy. I don't mind oranges, I do like nuts, and I should like a pocket knife that really cuts. But oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man. He wrote this message out and gat him to this room again, descending by the spout. And all that night he lay there, a prey to hopes and fears. I think that's him a-coming now. Anxiety bedewed his brow. He'll bring one present anyhow, the first I've had for years. Forget about the crackers and forget about the candy. I'm sure a box of chocolates would never come in handy. I don't like oranges. I don't want nuts. And I have got a pocket knife that almost cuts. But oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man. Next morning, when the sun rose up to tell a waiting world that Christmas had begun, and people seized their stockings and opened them with glee, and crackers, toys, and games appeared, and lips with sticky sweets were smeared, King John said grimly, as I feared, nothing again for me. I did want crackers, and I did want candy. I know a box of chocolates would come in handy. I do love oranges. I did want nuts. I haven't got a pocket knife, not one that cuts. And oh, if Father Christmas had loved me at all, he would have brought a big red India rubber ball. King John stood by the window and frowned to see below the happy bands of boys and girls all playing in the snow. A while he stood there watching and envying them all, when through the window, big and red, there hurtled by his royal head and bounced and fell upon the bed an India rubber ball. And oh, Father Christmas, my blessings on you fall for bringing him a big red India rubber ball.
Last year, some in the British press expressed outrage that the traditional Norwegian Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square was in less than perfect condition. They may do well to read and possibly even be humbled by the excellent book The King and the Christmas Tree by A.N. Wilson, from which the following extracts are drawn. Every year in the middle of London, a huge Norway spruce, 20 metres and more high, is erected in Trafalgar Square. Many who see it must take it for granted. It's Christmas time, so let's put up a tree. The London tree, however, tells us a particular story. It is the story, really, of a king, a very remarkable king, and of his people, the brave, indomitable people of Norway. The Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square is not just any old tree, such as you might see decorating a shopping mall or a civic space, any old where. At the base of the tree stands a plaque bearing the words, this tree is given by the city of Oslo as a token of Norwegian gratitude to the people of London for their assistance during the years 1940 to 45. Though it comes and goes each year, and is to that extent as ephemeral as the seasons, the Norwegian Christmas tree could claim to be among the most remarkable memorials contained in that square, which is so packed with links to history. The tree reminds us of the political and social values that were being defended with such amazing valor and determination when the first tree was erected in 1942. That tree and every tree since has spoken of what the friendship stood for between Norway, invaded but refusing to accept conquest, and Britain, resisting not the German-speaking people who probably invented the very idea of Christmas trees, but the dark powers of the Third Reich. The hundreds of white lights that decorate the tree are beacons of an imperishable light, memorials of a remarkable story. Invaded in April 1940, Norwegian forces were soon overwhelmed, but the government refused to surrender, and both the Prime Minister and the King, a constitutional monarch par excellence, were quite determined that they should not be taken prisoner. There followed an astonishing cat and mouse period as they moved to the frozen north and eventually were smuggled on ships bound for Scotland. They also protected Norway's gold reserves by smuggling out 53 tons in small fishing vessels and hence were able to finance the Norwegian resistance and ensure the king and his government in exile in London were never dependent on another nation for financial help. The Norwegian Merchant Navy played a crucial role in keeping the Allies fed, and the resistance managed to stymie the entire Nazi plan for building a nuclear weapon. Philip Mill Baker, Parliamentary Under Secretary, said, I often wonder how things would have gone if Norway had not resisted German occupation, if Norway had done as stronger nations did and said, what's the use? I can well imagine that Great Britain would not have been able to hold out when things were at their worst if it had not been for the help we got from the Norwegians, not least from the Norwegian Merchant Navy. I know what dangers the Norwegian crews are exposed to. I also know that two-fifths of the petrol that reaches this country comes in Norwegian tankers. I know that Norwegian tankers are playing the same role in the Battle of the Atlantic as the Spitfires played in the Battle of Britain in the summer and autumn of 1940. Great Britain will never forget what Norway has done. Well, when King Haakon reached his 70th birthday in August 1942, there was an outpouring of affection and admiration from Norwegians everywhere. Resistance fighter Mons Ursengard sent a Norwegian pine as a gift to his exiled king. His Norwegian pine was not a sensible thing. It was, however, a palpable, organic part of Norway. It had grown out of Norwegian soil and was now making its way to Norway's king, the man who had demonstrated the unconquerable potency of not doing the sensible thing. Well, the king gifted the tree to Londoners, 
and so it was first erected in Trafalgar Square in the middle of the war. No electric lights, there was still a blackout, but evergreen with defiant hope. From this memory sprang a tradition that has been continued from 1947, the year when Princess Elizabeth married Prince Philip, an event attended by King Haakon. Always the tree has been chosen long before. It is selected with great care in the spring before it is felled. They usually choose a tree of around 80 years old, and they're looking for one with vigorous growth at least 20 meters high. From the moment the tree is selected, the foresters revere and cosset her. They call her the queen of the forest. When the time comes for the felling towards the end of November, Norwegian school children gather to sing carols. British representatives, usually the Lord Mayor of Westminster and the British ambassador to Norway, take part in the felling itself, typically with the Mayor of Oslo holding one end of the saw and the Lord Mayor of Westminster the other, for the cameras at least. Certainly the whole story of the tree and its journey appears like a symbol of Northern European history over the last century. The school children gathered in the snow and singing of universal peace come from every nationality and every ethnicity. The tree itself, the queen of the forest, follows the same sea journey as its war-struck predecessor. Ensconced in Trafalgar Square and decorated in traditional Norwegian style, the tree is ready for the civic ceremony, which marks the beginning of the Christmas season for so many Londoners. They gather to sing carols, not about an invisible Führer, but about a little refugee baby lying in straw. Many who gather around the tree to sing the traditional carols of Christmas have no belief such as King Haakon had in the actual truth of the Christian religion. Nevertheless, each year, the repetition of the story of the Creator who declared the invaluable sanctity of every human life by taking flesh and the vulnerability of a human baby is overwhelmingly powerful.
So now has come our joyful feast, let every man be jolly. Each room with ivy leaves is dressed, and every post with holly. Though some churls at our mirth repine, round your forehead garlands twine. Drown sorrow in a cup of wine, and let us all be merry. Now all our neighbours' chimneys smoke, and Christmas blocks are burning. Their ovens they with baked meats choke, and all their spits are turning. Without the door let sorrow lie, and if for cold it have to die, we'll bury it in a Christmas pie, and evermore be merry. Now every lad is wondrous trim, and no man minds his labour. Our lasses have provided them a bagpipe and a tabor. Young men and maids, and girls and boys, give life to one another's joys. And you anon shall by their noise perceive that they are merry. Rank misers now do sparing shun, their hall of music soundeth, and dogs thence with whole shoulders run, so all things aboundeth. The country folk themselves advance, for crowdy muttons come out of France, and Jack shall pipe and Jill shall dance, and all the town be merry. Hark how the wags abroad do call each other forth to rambling, anon you'll see them in the hall for nuts and apples scrambling. Hark how the roofs with laughter sound, anon they'll think the house goes round, for they the cellar's depths have found, and there they will be merry. The wenches with their wassail bowls about the streets are singing, the boys are come to catch the owls the wild mare in is bringing. Our kitchen boy hath broke his box, and to the dealing of the ox, our honest neighbours come by flocks, and here they will be merry. Now kings and queens poor sheep coats have, and mate with everybody. The honest now may play the knave, and wise men play at noddy. Some youths will now a mumming go, some others play at Rowland Ho, and twenty other game boys mow, because they will be merry. Then wherefore in these merry days should we, I pray, be duller? No, let us sing some roundelays to make our mirth the fuller. And whilst we thus inspired sing, let all the streets with echoes ring, woods, hills, everything, bear witness we are merry.
As always, it was late. As always, this was our final call. The snow had a fine crust upon it, and the old trees sparkled like tinsel. We grouped ourselves around the farmhouse porch. The sky cleared, and broad streams of stars ran down over the valley and away to Wales. On Slad's white slopes, seen through the black sticks of its woods, some red lamps still burned in the windows. Everything was quiet. Everywhere there was the faint, crackling silence of the winter night. We started singing, and we were all moved by the words and the sudden trueness of our voices. Pure, very clear, and breathless we sang. thousand Christmases became real to us then. The houses, the halls, the places of paradise had all been visited. The stars were bright to guide the kings through the snow. And across the farmyard we could hear the beasts in their stalls. We were given roast apples and hot mince pies. In our nostrils were spices like myrrh. And in our wooden box, as we headed back from the village, there were golden gifts for all.
cross the moor. It's 20 years since we last met. Of course, Mr. R and I once thought we were made for each other. Oh, that heart-stopping moment by the kitchen sink when he took off his spectacles and fiercely kissed me. But all that lasted less than a week, and what I recall more vividly is Mrs. R's good advice. Always plunge your lemons in hot water before you squeeze them. One more year, perhaps. Thank you for all coming this evening, the 26th year of Follow the Stars, for supporting our vital work and for helping us be there for more people with cancer this Christmas. It hardly needs saying, but almost every one of us is touched by a cancer in some way. In fact, someone is diagnosed with cancer in the UK every 90 seconds. At Macmillan, we'll do whatever it takes to be there for every one of you be it our nurses, our specialist advisors, on the end of the phone or providing grants to people who just can't afford the basics right now. Macmillan is here for everyone, seven days a week, online, on, on the phones and in person. We provide practical, financial and emotional support directly and with our valuable partners. With your support, we have helped more people than ever before in 2022 but we know this number will grow. We all know there is more demand in the UK for cancer treatment than the NHS can support right now. One in four people with cancer feel like they just can't afford life right now. 
For them, the true cost of living crisis is the agonising decisions they're being forced to make every day. For example, we know people are choosing between going to medical appointments or going to work due to fears of losing their daily wage or job. These pressures are only heightened with record delays for appointments. Macmillan grants are just one of the ways we can provide a lifeline to people living with cancer right now. That's a rapid payment of £350 to meet the immediate needs and release some of the intense pressures on people's lives. With your support, we work hard to help more people live well with cancer, to advocate for more NHS nurses, government support, and to promote even earlier awareness of cancer, as we know the devastating impact of late diagnosis on individuals and families, plus the added pressure on the health system. By attending this evening, you're making a huge difference to people living with cancer, and we wanted to say thank you. Every pound you donate will help us reach someone live better, including to keep their heating on or to get their appointments. I'd like to thank the Follow the Stars team. Without their continued support, this event wouldn't be possible. Together, they have raised over £550,000 for Macmillan since the first concert in 1996. I would also like to say a special thank you to all our incredible guest readers as well as all to as well to our amazing musicians for performing this evening outside and inside and the many others who have made this evening a truly magical experience for, for us all. Cancer is increasingly about living with cancer your worries are our worries, and we will move mountains to help you live life as fully as you can. Thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful evening and festive season. Remember that P.G. Woodhouse story where Jeeves shimmers into the presence on a Christmas morning in a Santa suit, waking Bertie with a steaming cup and a sonorous, What ho, 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 sir? God bless us, everyone. Neither do I. Never happened. As seasons go, Yuletide did not recommend itself to Woodhouse. My favourite carol is Christmas Comes but once a year. He tended not to write about Christmas, but around it. In Christmas Presents, an essay written in 1915, Woodhouse makes his case succinctly. Presents must be bought, and the only thing to do is to try and get off as lightly as possible. So how is this dodge to be managed? The first rule in buying Christmas presents is to select something shiny. This advice seems puzzling, but makes more sense in the light of rule number two, which follows. Select something which shall be capable of being passed on to somebody else. Aha! Here we have the keystone of the Woodhouse system. Ungenerous? No, not in the least. Gift giving is all about humaneness and consideration for others. And what could be more humane, more considerate, than enabling a friend or relative to present a future gift without that expenditure which it is always so pleasant to avoid? While Woodhouse doesn't explain the shiny rule, I get it. A shiny gift is easier to pass on. After you're in the cupboard, it can be buffed to look new. It won't go bad, like fancy edibles, and one size fits all. If it's successfully re-gifted often enough, it may even come back to you. Consider the smoker's ideal comrade, which I received on Christmas Day 1922. It was given me by one of my uncles, 
and it had everything, including a brass cigar cutter, which makes smoking distasteful to the right-thinking man. I hesitate, for I'm, I'm not quite sure of my facts to make such an accusation, but I rather think the thing included a velvet smoking cap. I gave it away in the autumn of 1923 to an old school friend as a wedding present and thought no more of it. What was my surprise on Christmas morning 1924 to receive it back from a distant cousin. I gave it away once again, Christmas 1925, only to unpack it in my home on the 24th of December 1930, this time as the gift of the very uncle who had first given it to me back in 1922. The thing had completed full circle and looked as good as new though it contained no smoking cap. It may be that it, it had never contained a smoking cap, or, or possibly the passage of time had wrought more heavily on the velvet than on the brass. I confess to a not unmanly wave of sentiment when I beheld it once more and thought of all the good men whom it had enabled to give a handsome Christmas present without expense. In a month from now, it will be starting out on its travels once again, <laughs> but on a different route, for I am sending it to a friend in Australia, whither I feel sure it has never yet penetrated. Much misery has been caused in an infinite number of homes by the practice of giving presents which cannot be treated in this way. He does not exaggerate. A case in point. At the first Christmas following our marriage, Stuart and I received a gift that failed to meet the Woodhouse criteria. While it was more loathsome even than the smoker's ideal companion, it was neither shiny nor re-giftable. It was sent by distant friends who'd been traveling in Asia and missed the nuptials. So this was both wedding and Christmas gift. It arrived in a big box, surrounded by foam peanuts and layered in tissue paper. As we began peeling away the layers, we were met with an odd smell, musty and a bit smoky. Dust rose from the tissuey depths. Coughing slightly, I opened a window. What em eventually emerged was a round-ish globular lump of something that looked like dried mud, about a foot in diameter, flat-ish on the bottom with a hole on top. What is it? There must be a note. There was. A small printed card explained that this was a vase of rare black clay handcrafted by contemporary artisans using 10,000 year old pottery techniques and fired unglazed in an earthen pit. Bumps and irregularities are part of its natural beauty. Do not wash dust with dry cloth. I picked it up. Then I put it down. My hands were covered in rare black clay dust. The thing was shedding. A small pool of grit had settled around its base. Stuart started fanning the air. What do we do with it? Do we have to keep it? What are the chances they'll come to visit? Stay calm. We'll think of something. Our eyes began to water. Well, you know them better than I do. Could it be a joke? No. They're artsy craftsy types. They probably think it's gorgeous. Maybe we can just tuck it away somewhere indefinitely. But in the meantime, I don't care what the instructions say. I'm washing it. I went into the kitchen for apron and gloves. How slippery is it? Not at all. Why? 
Well, when you're washing it with your hands, soapy and all, you might happen to uh, accidentally drop it. We looked at each other for a while. That could happen, I said. Let there be peace. Let there be peace, so frowns fly away like albatross, and skeletons foxtrot from cupboards, so war correspondents become travel show presenters, and magpies bring back lost property, children, engagement rings, broken things. Let there be peace, so storms can go out to sea to be angry and return, to me, calm. So the broken can rise up and dance in the hospitals. Let the aged Ethiopian man in the grey block of flats peer through his windows and see Addis before him. So his thrilled, outstretched arms become frames for his dreams. Let there be peace. Let tears evaporate to form clouds, cleanse themselves, and fall into reservoirs of drinking water. Let harsh memories burst into fireworks that melt in the dark pupils of a child's eyes and disappear like shoals of silver darting fish. And let the waves reach the shore with a shh.
As this wonderful event draws to a close, some moments for stillness and prayer at the end of this day and in the midst of this busy season. Father, there was no room for your son in the inn. Protect with your love those who have no home and all who live in poverty. Mary, in the pain of labor, brought your son to birth. Hold in your hand all who are in pain or distress and those who sit and wait with them. Your Christ came as a light shining in the darkness. Bring comfort to all who suffer in the sadness of our world and all who work to relieve that suffering. Strangers found the Holy Family and saw the baby lying in the manger. Bless our homes and all whom we love. In this season, heaven is come down to earth, and earth is raised to heaven. Hold in your hand all those who have passed through death in the hope of your coming kingdom. Father, angels and shepherds worship to the manger throne. Receive the worship we offer in fellowship with Mary, Joseph, and all the saints, through him who is your word made flesh, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're able, I invite you to stand for our prayer of blessing. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas time. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen.